All right, David here, back to wrap things up before we proceed to the hands-on activities. So I want to wrap up with a bit of another story about some research software that's recently become uh, fairly visible in the news. Back in March of 2019, no, 2020, uh, Neil Ferguson, who's a professor at Imperial College in the UK, briefed their parliament on some modeling he and his group had done of the COVID-19 pandemic. And those models helped prompt uh, government action, uh, not surprisingly. But uh, models have a lot of assumptions built into them. Uh, and they're also stochastically modeled. They have, they're based on random numbers. Uh, in, at the beginning of April, Nicholas Lewis uh, wrote a blog article that said, you know, he can't even, can't easily see where some of these assumptions came from. And he said, moreover, the computer code is old, unverified and documented inadequately, if at all. So he started calling uh, this code, research code into question. And of course, given the times, the uh, news outlets picked up on this. So this generated a lot of uh, press in the UK, especially, but not, not only there. And so you see the headline in the upper right, Imperial College model Britain used to justify lockdown is a buggy mess, totally unreliable. You have quotes from commercial software developers who say we would fire anyone for developing code like this. You have professors quoted saying, you know, models must be capable of passing basic scientific tests of reproducing the results, uh, impossible to reproduce. This group in Edinburgh on the right found uh, a bug, first of a number of bugs that they found, they did submit it and, and got fixed quickly, but um, nevertheless, finding bugs uh, is not an easy way uh, to instill confidence in research software. So this is where, um, uh, you know, sort of the press went with it, and this was kind of the big story. What you may not have heard is that after that, um, some other things happened. Later in April, Imperial College collaborated with Microsoft to refactor and clean up the code, and they released it on GitHub. So the original code was publicly available, and this new cleaned up version was also available. In May, uh, Phil Ball wrote uh, in a blog article uh, that sort of rebutted some of the criticisms, the public criticisms that have been made of the Imperial Code, and this is highlighted up to the right. Uh, scientists write code that's crappy stylistically, but which is nevertheless scientifically correct. He says, um, also commercial software developers are well qualified to review code style, but most don't have a clue about checking scientific validity or what counts as good scientific practice. And this is, uh, these comments also spurred some discussion within our ideas project, which I'll, I'll get to uh, on the next slide. Uh, but finally, to wrap things up, there's an organization in the UK called CodeCheck, which does independent verification of computationally based results. And they took on the original report that Neil Ferguson's testimony to the parliament was based on. Uh, and they actually confirmed the results of uh, found in that report. And uh, so the you know, despite all the other things about results being not being reproducible and things like that, they this group was in fact able to uh, reproduce the results. So what do we learn from this story? Well, one thing to learn is that uh, your code's likely to live longer than you expect, and it may be used in ways you don't anticipate by people you don't even know. So it's really a good idea if you're going to make your code available to the public to plan for this kind of um, activity and and maybe this kind of scrutiny because also increasingly we make as a um, um, as a, a community as a world increasingly consequential decisions based on purely computational results and so I think it's quite justified that the codes that are generating those results should be subject to greater scrutiny and of course they should be um, uh, we should have be able to have confidence in them. And so the scientific credibility of the software that we do our science with is strongly connected to good software engineering practices in this story and in what we've discussed uh, earlier today. You've heard about you know, inadequate documentation or claims of inadequate documentation. You've heard about concern, heard of concerns about testing and verification and validation. You've heard about you know, even just code re 
readability and other kind of basic quality metrics, which um, if some independent person wants to look at your code and get some confidence in it, if they find it very hard to read, that's surely just not going to help things uh, at best. And so back to this question uh, uh, about what Phil Bull said, he's, um, you know, basically, should we actually take him at his word and excuse scientific software for being crappy stylistically? I think we've all seen software. I know nobody here would write software that's crappy stylistically, but I've, I'm sure we've all seen scientific software that's, uh, you know, kind of crappy looking. And is that really a problem for our community? And the conclusion that we came to within uh, our ideas project from these discussions is that there's a really important issue here is that uh, crappy code makes it easier for bugs to hide. It goes back to read readability and other related things. And it's just harder, it's easier for those things to stay in the code. And so it really is worth trying to produce good quality, good looking, readable code. And that's, a, um, I think, a good lesson for everybody to take away. It comes back to this, this mantra that we've been saying throughout the day, science through computing is at best as credible as a software that produces it. And so if you want to do credible science, uh, you should really think about how to make that software as credible as possible, no matter who might look at it. We covered a lot of different project uh, topics in this um, tutorial today. We talked about project management. We talked about ways to collaborate around software development, talked about software design and testing and continuous integration and refactoring for all these for large complex software systems that often uh, occur in scientific software. And we also uh, talked a lot about reproducibility, including this final story. There are a lot of other things in this space that we really didn't have time to talk about today. Um, these are also important topics and don't get us wrong here. We really wish we had time to talk about all of these things, but many of these things are um, in some respects less, you know, in many cases, there's a difference between sort of the research software world and the commercial software world. Um, in terms of the expectations and the requirements and the way projects are done. Um, in many of these cases, we feel that that's less the case, right? So you're more likely to be able to go out onto the internet or read books or things like that and find discussions of uh, these kinds of practices, probably from a perspective of more on the commercial software side, but they, um, in most cases, will still apply pretty well to research software. Also, these things are kind of secondary concerns for starting researchers. So one of the things we tried to do in designing the tutorial that we gave today is to think about what are some of the most important things, especially for early stage researchers and software developers to think about. That's not to say that we didn't try to you know, cover topics that would also be relevant for people later in their careers, but we think it's important to help get uh, younger researchers onto a good path. And that's one of the things we're really trying to do here. Uh, and finally, there's you know, only so much time in the day. We just don't, we, we've spent a day with you talking about these topics. You know, if you look at this list, we could spend several more days. And unfortunately, SC just doesn't give us a chance to do that. Um, uh, maybe in the future, we'll develop some additional modules and have our own extended tutorial, but that's um, not where we are at present. So that's what we've had to do. Okay, you say, we've been through all this. Um, I've heard about all these best practices and things like that, but I'm a researcher and I can't afford to spend all of my time on software engineering. Um, you know, what do I do with all this stuff you've talked about today? Well, I wanna go back to something we talked about pretty early on, which is the idea of incremental software process improvement. So really, what you want in your scientific software projects is just enough software engineering that you can meet both your short-term and your longer-term scientific goals effectively. So that's really what you wanna be thinking about as you're going through things. Um, and we have this strategy called PSIP, Productivity and Sustainability Improvement Planning, which is a fairly simple process uh, that you can use to help incrementally improve your processes to reach this goal. And basically it works as follows. So you start by identifying 
your team's pain points with respect to software development. Okay, what, what is giving you the most problem? There are some tools out there like this Rate Your Project tool that can help identify those issues, but really it's, it's a per project thing. And you really need to think about your experiences within your team. So pick something out of that list and set a goal that this is what I want to improve. It's better to target processes and behaviors, not just tasks. In other words, don't say we need to produce more documentation, but rather how do we ensure that every time a new piece of code gets checked in or a um, change gets checked in, that the appropriate documentation is also updated or provided, right? It's good to pick something that you can address in a few months time so that you can get a noticeable benefit before you forget that you're embarking on this endeavor and it draws out too long. And then you should agree on a plan to address it. As a group, you should get together and identify what, what are the steps along the way and when do you decide when you're actually done with this process improvement. Write them down. We call this a progress tracking card. And there are some examples uh, at that link that you can see if you want to get some ideas about how it looks. Uh, and then you go spend a few months working to your plan. You track your progress as you get done with the, these milestones on your progress tracking card. You check them off. And when you reach the done stage, you have a little celebration. And then you're ready to move on and pick a new pain point to address. And what we're really trying to do with this process is bend the curve of software development cost over time, right? So you may put a little extra time early on in the process. Uh, you get a bump up in that green curve, but overall it's meant to save you time. And uh, with something like this, you can experiment so that, you know, if something you find something is not working the way you hoped it is, you can back it off. This is a small incremental improvement. You can back off that increment and try something different. And so um, this is a process we recommend. You can go to that link, bssw.io slash PSIP to get some more information. And there are other resources on this site. And I also want to um, mention bssw.io is a, a site that's intended to also provide general resources for these sorts of uh, questions and for many others about software development. So um, please use it to find resources, consider contributing resources if you've got things that uh, in mind that we don't have. So with that, we've reached the end of the formal presentations in our tutorial today. Uh, we'd really like to keep in touch with you. We'd like to hear back from you with comments and feedback and questions at the uh, email address uh, here shown on the slide. If you work on the hands-on activities, as we've said, uh, give us pull requests, give us uh, issues, and we'll comment on those and provide feedback. Of course, you can also email us if you want. And just a reminder of the tutorial website where you can find all the materials or links to all the materials uh, related to this tutorial. Eventually, we'll get uh, videos posted as well if you want to go back and, and review those. And finally, if you're interested in following uh, us in the Ideas Productivity Project or following um, new material as it appears on the Better Scientific Software site, there's a couple of mailing lists there that you can subscribe to. And with that, we have a couple minutes for questions and we can move on to the hands-on activities. Thank you very much for um, your participation in today's tutorial and uh, we'll get going into the hands-on part.